Okay, so we might we might kick off. Um, hi everyone, I'm Joanna and I'm DSC's Global Advisor for Accountability. Welcome to our very exciting mini workshop today on human-centered design. Um, we hope that you will get a small taste of and enjoy experiencing for yourself the very basics of a human-centered design approach to learn how to embed a human perspective in your projects and digital ways of working. Um, whether we like it or not, of course, we know that digitalization is happening at a rapid pace and it can't be ignored. And as mentioned in previous uh, keynotes today, technology can help to improve the quality and effectiveness of our work. It can also help us to be more accountable, but with these opportunities, we have enormous responsibility to ensure that it benefits everyone equally. And whether we use technology to improve our accountability to people, or we simply want to be accountable for the use of digital methods, this will always include prioritising listening, to the perspectives and experiences of affected people themselves and considering and then very importantly acting upon this feedback so that programs can be more relevant, accessible and, and safe. Uh, we always have a duty to be responsible and answerable for what we do and how we do it in our humanitarian work. And in the deep dive sessions in the lead up to this event, there was significant discussion around how we can work to put ethics, accountability, or a real human or user end perspective in the design of our projects and digital ways of working at the very outset. We also agreed that there can be, of course, no genuine accountability if decisions about our programs or tech solutions are not made with the people they are designed for, which helps us to ensure that we really place people, their needs uh, and priorities at the centre of our work. And human centred design is a discipline that can support us to do this. Um, and now briefly to some housekeeping. We would like to encourage interaction throughout the session as much as possible. So feel, feel free to use the chat at any time to share your ideas, comments and questions. We'll go through them at dedicated times during the session. Um, given the challenges within this platform for breakout room discussions, we have dedicated opportunities for more larger group discussions and questions. And we will also announce these. And when we do, we will ask you to contribute if you're comfortable by sharing your audio and, vis uh, and video. Um, there will be a blue button, apparently, I'm told, in the right corner that will say ask to share audio and video. So please feel free to use that when asked to by our session lead, Cindy Dawes, who will take us through the session today. And lastly, to introduce our speaker, it is really, really exciting to have Cindy join us today. Um, she's a senior strategic designer at Huddle based in Australia. Her work includes supporting the development of human-centered design approaches across all areas of practice. She has supported, for example, central banks to change this as strategies, assisted a whole of service reform for children's courts, encouraged new ways to deliver mental health services, and works to train, coach, and guide people in learning and applying a human-centered design approach to their work. Thank you so much, Cindy, for joining us, uh, especially so late in the night. I think it's midnight all the way from Melbourne, Australia, also my hometown. Um, we very much look forward to your session and myself and my colleague Alexandra will be assisting with monitoring the chat and questions along the way. And it's with absolute pleasure that I now hand it over to you, Cindy, and thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you so much, Jo. It's so lovely to have so many people here. Um, we're going to do our best with the limitations of this platform to make this interactive, but um, there will be a bit of talking from me. Um, as Joe said, this is really a bit of a primer. If any of you did the networking, it's a, it's a bit like that. You did some speed dating with other people, and this is a bit like speed dating around what is human-centered design and how can you maybe um, start to think about embedding it more in your practice or give language to things that you're already doing. Um, as part of framing it, I want to just reflect back a little bit on what Nick was talking about. I found his um, presentation so powerful. And he talked about the mission being to put the perspective of affected people on the table. And I guess what we're hoping to explore a little bit in the next hour or so is how we can go beyond putting that perspective on the table and actually bring those people to the table so that they are designing with you. Um, why human-centred design? Well, it's suitable for complex problems. And if you've spent any time in this event today, you will be um, reflecting on the complexity and the increasing complexity of the world in which you work. 
I guess the other thing I want to say before we get right into it is that I know in your work, in the machinery of the work and in the governance structures, and in the sheer crisis nature of what's facing you, it might be easy to forget sometimes that there are actual unique humans at the centre of that work with unique aspirations and needs. And what we're going to be trying to do is look at how we might bring that back to the fore. Um, I'm going to be using the terms human-centred design, but what I want to do now is just tell you a little bit about what that might encompass. So at Huddle, which I'll talk a little bit about shortly, we're actually starting to look at moving beyond human-centred design to something that we're starting to call therapeutic design. And Melissa Nova, one of our founders, is in this session um, as well, and she might speak to this a bit later if it comes up. So a couple of things that are particularly noteworthy for this group, I think, is that one, the people you work with are impacted by trauma. And so our work and your work should be trauma informed. People's brains develop differently as a result of trauma and how we put them at the center needs to be considered and maybe different to how we would put other people at the center. And the second thing to say, which I guess is also um, opposite given last year, your global event was around climate change, is that actually being human centered as a society has taken us to where we are today. And if we're to thrive and the planet is to thrive, we need to move beyond that. We need to look at design and solutions that are healing for humans and all the planet. So I'm gonna talk about human-centered design, but really we mean therapeutic healing design. And I'm gonna focus on two things today, mindsets and looking at a method. Um, if we can go to a slide now, Alexandra, maybe skip to the second slide, straight to the second slide. Thank you. So today, as Joe mentioned, I am coming to you from Australia. And what you're looking at now is a map that is all the First Nations of Australia. And I'm coming to you from the very bottom, not the little circle, which is Tasmania, but the very bottom, I'm coming to you from Boonwurrung, Boonwurrung country. And here in Australia, we have our own forcibly displaced people. All of those nations were displaced and many of the issues facing all of you and your humanitarian work all over the world in relation to the digital world are also facing our Indigenous population here. So I, I want to start with an acknowledgement um, of the traditional custodians of the land I'm on and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to all elders of Indigenous nations all over the world and um, hope that we can learn from them. Now, the one thing I want you to take away before I get into any detail is that I'm not going to talk about the digital world and I'm not going to talk about humanitarian content. We're going to be talking about a way of being and a way of working. And the thing that is most important is that it's about who you bring to the work. In fact, it's so important that Melissa, who I mentioned earlier, wrote a whole book about it, which was how to be the designer, because what you bring is going to be what creates that outcome. So let's move on to some more slides now. Next slide. Okay, now I want you to look at this for a, a few seconds and I want anyone to tell me what they think it is and what it's designed to do. So I guess you could use your chat function here. Let's have a look. Dark architecture, presenting pe preventing people from crossing, stopping people from walking. Optimistic Joanna thinks it's art. <laughs> yeah, prevent the homeless from sleeping, keep people away from sleeping from the bridge. That is what it's designed for. This is a street in China and there's very great shelter under a bridge there. But somebody has designed it so that it's, it is dark architecture, isn't it? It's scary and it's uncomfortable and it, it can form no utility for homeless people looking for something. So if we think about who might have had a role in designing this and making it like this, who would have been involved in that? Any thoughts? I'm going to keep my eye on the chat. City planning councils, uh-huh. 
Yeah, people who drive cars probably. I don't imagine that any of the people who may have needed to sleep rough were given an opportunity to think about how um, that area might have been planned. I don't think they were asked and I'm pretty sure their perspective wasn't on the table. So this is an example of anti-human centered design. And we see this everywhere. We see it in services, we see it in architecture, we see it in programs. So I just wanted to give you that as a little taster before we move on to looking at why is human-centered design so important and why might it be useful for you in the work you do and in the climate in which we find ourselves. So let's move to the next slide, Alexandra. Okay, so there's a, there's a taxonomy of um, problem types, which is this one here. It's, it's based on something called the Kniffen Framework. And one of the things that someone said earlier in the event today um, was uh, Raj Berman from Tech, Tech Fugees, I cannot say that. And he said that in the crisis in which we find ourselves and the environment in which we are working, conventional wisdom is our enemy. And that really struck with me because if we look at these kind of problems, we have simple problems where we know things, everything is known and it's very simple to solve. Then we have complicated problems, fixing a car, making an aeroplane, surgery. They, they're not easy, but they're complicated in that doing something you've done before, following the manual, et cetera, will lead to a result and it'll be a good result. And then we move into more complex problems. So we have complex problems where there are unknown unknowns to use examples that are not of your world, how to make a great schooling experience, how to take people on a change journey so that they feel loved and looked after and confident and competent. And then we move to chaos, the fourth kind, natural disaster. Now, the way in which we learn in these environments is by doing something. It's not by thinking, it's not by looking to the past, you know, it's not by looking at that conventional wisdom. It's by taking an action, learning, pivoting and iterating. And that's precisely the kind of approach that we take in human centered design. So that's a bit of framing. Next slide, Alexandra. I feel like I'm running down a hill because we're on a time thing here. OK, who's heard of VUCA? Just put something in the chat because I'm not going to go through it if you're all familiar with it. A question already. Yep. What's our question, Joe? I'm happy to take questions all the way through. Joanna? You're on mute. Okay, I'm going to keep going and you can let me know the question at some point. Okay, so there's this thing called VUCA. The um, military actually came up with it and they were learning that they couldn't do warfare in the same way that they had done before. There's increasing volatility, context changes fast. There's uncertainty. Things are disruptive. Again, the past is not a good predictor of the future. Complexity upon complexity upon complexity means things are interconnected. And we have increasing ambiguity. I mean, the world of, of non-facts and false news um, leads to that. So these things as well lead to human-centered design being really important and um, a good way of solving problems. And then finally, we have your own agenda. Next slide, Alexandra. So we know that what you are seeking to do is uphold the rights of effective people and redistribute power. We want to make sure that there's inclusion and representation in decision making. You want to ensure effective people have agency to decide how and when and which decisions they engage upon. And you want to listen so that people can lead locally driven responses. 
So the kind of work that we do in human-centered design is explicitly designed to help you do those things. So that's a bit of framing. If anyone wants to ask a question at this point, maybe just ask to speak. You can request to speak or you can just pop it in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to proceed because I can't see any of your faces. So it's a bit tricky, but let's, let's keep going. All right, so next slide. If you as humanitarian workers are working in country, you're working with donors, you could be working in a range of places. How is it that you can actually go beyond listening and support people to be the catalysts for change? That's what we want to do, okay? We want to actually deliver on people's needs and we want to do something meaningful. And this is where what you bring is going to make the difference. So let's have a look at some mindsets that we feel really support the work. So Melissa's done these beautiful illustrations. I also just want to let you know that I'll make these slides, DRC have these slides, and I'm, we're very happy for them to distribute them to any of you on this um, session. So let's think about some mindsets that might be a little different to the mindsets we ordinarily bring to our work. A beginner's mind, always learning, looking at something completely afresh as a child, being in the present, not the past, not even the future, but just looking at what's in front of you and being open to being a beginner and not knowing. A very important mindset that helps you expand and listen in that way that Nick talked about. A liquid mind, the ability to change your perspective and your position on things. Sometimes in our work, we feel we need to take a position and advocate for it, but that stops us seeing new positions and it stops us listening and being able to make connections between new things. So a liquid mindset is something that we want to bring to bear. An open mind might sound the same as a liquid mind, but it's not. It's about... Um, questioning and being aware of your own perspectives and beliefs and values and being prepared to change them, recognising that beliefs are not facts, they're things that we made up and maybe what you are listening to and what you are seeing and observing is going to be something that really changes a belief that you have about something. So being able to do that is a really important attribute of someone who's who's really willing to go to that human-centered place. A creative mind. I bet as soon as you heard that, many of you are thinking, I'm not really that creative. You know, I'm a scientist or I come from an evidence-based background. Well, if you're a human being, you are creative. We're designed to be creative. You need to give yourself permission to question everything. Everything's on the table. Later on, we'll look at constraints in your work, but right at the start, have that mindset where you just think everything is up for grabs and nothing needs to be static. We couple this with a disciplined mindset, which is about practicing mindfulness again about your beliefs and also being self-aware as a practitioner because you are in this work. You are not separate to this work and, and being having a disciplined mindset means that you are constantly, in an easy way, but constantly questioning what you're doing and where you're coming from and reflecting on what kind of mindset you're in. It's a bit meta, this disciplined one. And then we look at being aware, having an aware mindset. And this is having the ability to be... Um, situationally present and really looking at what's going on and um, around the topic. So really, really getting into it. And then a whole mind is about being systematic and looking at the interconnected of things, being systemic, not just looking at the one thing. Now, I know I've gone through these all really quickly but now I'd really love to open up for some discussion to see if this is resonating with people, 
if this is new to you, if you can reflect on when you've done this and what it might have um, meant for you. So Joanna, is there any way we can open this up? Or Alexandra? Yeah, so if, if people would like to contribute to speaking, um, please just says there should be a blue button in the top right corner um, that says request audio or video, please press it. Um, we welcome your feedback and your ideas and your opinions. And if not, please just feel free to also share via the chat. Either or is fine. But mm. uh, yeah, we will see the requests for people who request to speak come up mm -hmm. and we will approve them. Mm. I think the reason I, I say that this is, I mean, this is kind of the secret sauce, okay? Because there's lots of methodologies and there's lots of tools and there's lots of ways of doing design and doing human-centered design. But actually the mindset that you bring to the work is going to be the thing that makes the difference. It's going to be the thing that actually moves power and supports you to reframe what you're seeing and to advocate for that work. Um, Azim talked about that very powerfully, I think, almost at the beginning when he was um, introducing the tech fugees. And I found that very compelling, actually, that, that notion of moving power and reframing. Any thoughts on mindsets? I'm happy to keep going. Maybe while we while we see and wait for people to, to raise their hands and, and request to speak, I would have one question. Um, yeah. And I've been reflecting a little bit when I saw your slides and I'm curious when you speak about the mindsets, we all yeah. come from a different background. We all bring our own worldview, our own biases specifically. Yeah. Um, and as much as we want to and try to take different mindsets and be as neutral, open-minded, um, we always have different views. So how can we, how can we handle our own biases in this to make sure that we are not missing out and don't, not having blind spots? Mm, that's a really great question, Alexandra. And it's not easy, actually. And I guess that's why we talk about having a disciplined mind and an open mind. And I guess a, a practical way of doing this is actually to confer with other people and to check in with others and test out whether they think you're bringing a bias and what that bias might be. And also to share and and recognize what your biases are and and we do all have them of course life creates them in us and we lay down those paths and they get stronger and stronger but the first step is knowing what they are and recognizing that you have them and then being able to sense when maybe they're getting in the way of something or they're creating a um a belief or a story around something that you're seeing that isn't necessarily true. It could be true, but it's worth checking. Yeah. Cindy, I also just have a quick question. Um, and yeah. we've spoken about this. I think quite often we all come from different kind of technical backgrounds. We might bring a human rights lens. We might bring a sector kind of lens, uh, a community development lens, whatever research lens, whatever it might be. And um, the, how do we kind of try to think outside of our own kind of technical area of expertise and really start from, from these kinds of mindsets like a beginner's mind and have you got any tips for how to actually adopt mm. these, these mindsets? Yeah, you know, in a, in a sec I'm going to flip and we're going to look at some things that get in the way of being this. But this is something that comes up a lot when we um, do training and we work with clients because... Let's face it, our expertise that looking at the list of people who are in this um, session today, a lot of you are experts and you have developed knowledge and skills and expertise over very many, many years. And you are known for that and that is what you bring to the table. So to suddenly ask you to put all of that aside and come at it as a beginner is actually quite confronting and can be quite scary, but you're not leaving all of that behind, you bring that to bear when you start moving into um, doing the work and looking for solutions and creating ideas. But it's just about that willingness to have an open mind and to, and to try and put what you know aside. It isn't easy always, but it's also once you get going, 
it's actually quite liberating and refreshing because you all have permission just to see what's in front of you. And it gives you permission to ask questions that are elemental, absolutely elemental about why someone is doing something or why something does or does not happen. Or, or if someone expresses a need to be able to just deep dive into what that need is about without give, having pressure on yourself to have to know that or be an expert. So actually, even though it's one of the hardest mindsets to get into for some people, um, the beginner's mindset, I personally find it the most liberating and most joyful. Yeah. I can see a question here. Shall I just read it out? Yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Okay. So we often work in contexts where there is no singular human interest and even competing and conflicting interests. Yes, take the example arch architecture where the interest of the general public, e.g. no homeless on the streets, has superseded the interest of the homeless themselves to shelter under the flyover. How best to factor this into human-centred design? That's a really, really great question. Um, and I'm going to quickly address it, given that we have very short amount of time. But one of the things that human-centred design thrives upon is multiple perspectives. You know, there's a saying, I don't know if everybody knows it, everybody knows more than somebody. So by bringing different perspectives and different needs to the table, we can gather a range of insights and we can look for opportunities to collaborate and design things that meet many people's needs. We do a lot of um, system-wide design and you know, sometimes people say we wanna be customer-centric, but there's no point creating an organization where the customer is delighted and all the people in that ecosystem, the staff and the vendors and suppliers are ground to the bone and their experience is made worse. And so that's one of the principles that we like to look at and particularly as we're moving towards therapeutic design is how can design be healing for as many as possible in the system? So I guess Edward, the answer to the question is about trying to establish processes and methods that do bring all those voices and insights and experiences to the table so that you can um, work through them. Yeah. We might move on to the next slide because I'm just conscious of time, which is partly your job to keep me on time, <laughs> Joanna. <laughs> all right, so we've looked at the mindsets that we would love to have that enable us to do this work. But as humans, as we've turned into adults, we've created a whole bunch of habits. And sometimes we lay those habits down and they get stronger and stronger. And they can really stop us from moving into those mindsets and giving ourselves the space and the time and the air to do that work. So let's have a look at some of them. And uh, what I'd love you to do is as I'm speaking about them, if you realize that you sometimes fall into this habit or you get rewarded for this habit, just put something in the chat, put a little emoji or um, emojicon or whatever they're called in this platform. So let's have a look. The first one, experience and expertise. Remember what we talked about earlier? In complex problems, the past does not necessarily teach us about the present or take us to the future. So relying on our experience and our expertise, however comfortable and however we've been rewarded in the past, isn't necessarily going to take us where we need to go. A singular perspective. This is a little bit um, related to what you asked, Edward. So a singular perspective is believing that, that my point of view is really the right one and sometimes the only one. And under pressure, it can be easy to fall into this habit, especially a time pressure, because it might feel quicker. But if you're coming from a singular perspective, whose values are you applying to the, to the problem in front of you? Which biases might be coming to bear without anybody to check them or contrast them? A lack of awareness. So again, this is going to get in the way of being able to see things systematically and seeing a whole ecosystem. Um, so not being mindful of the whole system, 
which also goes with an object focus, which is something that is very easy to get into. There's one thing and we're going to fix that. But actually, that habit might stop us coming up with a solution that's really meaningful and supports the outcomes that those people we're working with need to have. A lack of courage. You know, people don't talk about courage very often. I mean, Brene Brown talks about it a lot, but not very many other people talk about courage. But it takes courage to do this kind of work because we know that big Big systems with lots of regulation and lots of danger can by their very nature be risk averse. And sometimes doing this work requires you to stand up and say, I don't know yet what the answer is, or to go against the flow, or to suggest giving up power, not, not just sharing power, but giving up power. And so that, that lack of courage, which sometimes we get rewarded for, because we have to be managing risk is a really easy habit to fall into. And then the habit of externalization, which is about seeking to attribute a solution elsewhere. So, you know, we know that the humanitarian sector is quite siloed and it's come up many times today in this event. And these silos lend themselves to people being able to or being rewarded or encouraged, in fact, to externalise something and think that someone else is going to deal with it. So do people recognise any of these habits in themselves? Alexandra is grimacing. <laughs> She's the only face I can see. <laughs> Here we go. Melissa's chiming in. I'm going to read out what Melissa said as well. So we are indoctrinated into an overculture of work that looks to a culture of work that looks to trade-offs, which is about or rather than and. And design insists on holding ambiguity for as long as possible. So we hold multiple things as simultaneously true. It's a bit like Schrodinger's cat. All things can be true for a while. And this increases our chances of being able to find and option, but this requires that we occupy a humble and curious place, which helps us practice the mindsets. Always very beautiful insights from Mollis. Have other people found themselves um, holding these habits or falling into them? There's no shame in admitting it. We all do it. We've been rewarded. We've been trained. Tricky, I can't see anybody. <laughs> there was a question, if I can, Cindy, from Isabella. What? Yeah. Um, the question is, unless, no, I don't think you touched on it, how do we best go about understanding and conveying the various mindsets of different people in mm -hmm. participatory design processes? Mm-hmm. We have a broader question. Okay. Yeah, I think there's, there's possibly a couple of things going on in that question, Isabella. Um, so the first is about um, having multiple people involved in the, in the um, design process and getting as many perspectives as possible. And that's quite a deliberate, um, intentional activity. So you, you would map out who could be possibly involved and make your circle as wide as possible within the constraints that you have. And then you would seek to do that listening and observing and questioning and insight gathering and then testing. Um, so involving multiple perspectives takes a lot of time. It can take more time than people are used to and it takes effort and it takes intention. So that's the, the piece around getting the multiple perspectives. And then how do you ensure that a variety of mindsets are present? Now, we don't necessarily occupy each mindset at any one given time. We want some fluidity between them. And again, that's that needs to be quite intentional. And like any muscle, it becomes easier the more you use it. But when you're beginning 
and you want to take this approach, you need to be quite conscious and deliberate and check yourself and think, ah, oh, what mindset am I in? Ah, oh, I'm in a quite a judgy mindset because I'm 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 taking this piece of information in and I'm immediately matching it to something I already know. And I've already started planning what I'm doing with it. So I'm not in an open mindset. I'm not open-minded. I'm not open to those new things coming into me. Or I'm really bringing my expertise in here when I'm speaking to this person, which means I've kind of stopped listening and I'm not asking very many questions and I'm not seeking to understand. So I'm not really exercising that beginner's mindset. So it does take quite conscious um, attention to yourself. And it is really great if you're thinking about having a go at being like this in your work to buddy up with someone, to have a partner um, so that you can support one another and have those conversations to reflect on how you went and how it felt and was there discomfort in you and how did you deal with that discomfort? I hope that answers your question, Isabella. Cindy, I would have also one more question, maybe, <clears throat> if I may. Um, coming to the blocking habits again, also, I and linked to Ed's question earlier. What if somebody who, who a perspective whom you would want to be included in the process to gain different perspectives and to make it an end instead of an or, what if mm. that side that refuses to participate, to acknowledge different perspectives, how do you deal with that? Mm. So the the group or the person that you would want to participate because you genuinely want their perspective, they refuse to participate. Yeah, well, you can't make people do things. <laughs> That's not very human-centred. But it would be worth trying to understand what is sitting behind their um, refusal to do that. It could be a trust issue. Um, we know that... Um, Often, often processes get talked about as if they are consultation or co-design, but there's quite a lot of, um, I'm going to use a vernacular phrase, window dressing. It's not really consultation and it's not really co-design and people may have low levels of trust. So it could be worth exploring whether that is going on. I mean, my, my advice from a really practical point of view would be to do your best to understand what could support them to participate and see if you can make that happen. Yeah, and if they, they can't participate or they won't participate, try and think of ways to bring their perspective into the conversation, which might be some research you already have or people who work very closely with that group. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, all right, so... Let's have a think. We've had a look at mindsets and habits that get in the way. And this is really about being the person doing the work, okay? But I know now that people love a method and they love a framework. So there are lots and lots of them. There's millions of them on the internet. But this is one framework in particular that we use at Huddle sometimes. And I'm going to take you through it. I'm going to use an example that has nothing to do with your sector, but we're going to circle back at the end and see how it might apply. So let's go to the next slide, Alexandra. All right. How many people have been told, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions? Has anyone ever been told that? I'm guessing yes. I certainly have very many times. Yes, Joanna is nodding. We, again, in the same way we get rewarded for our expertise, we get rewarded for jumping straight to a solution. You know, Einstein famously said if he had, I don't know, 10 minutes to work on a problem, to um, design something, he would spend nine minutes on the problem, working out what the problem was, and a minute on the solution. But what we very commonly see is someone comes to you with something which might be, let's think about a commercial example, we need to increase prices. They think this is the solution. 
and they don't want to talk to you about the problem. But let's look if we just expand our thinking and we take a design approach, what might that help us do? Let's move to the next slide, Alexandra. Okay, so if we asked why do we need to increase prices and we look to reframe, again, something that's come up quite a lot today, we might learn that we need increased revenue to thrive. So revenue in this organisation that makes widgets might be dropping and they need to increase their revenue. So it's still quite a problem statement and it's still quite concrete. Let's see how we can expand that more so that we've got more space to come up with a solution. Okay, so maybe we do some research and we talk to some customers and we seek to expand the knowledge that we have and to expand our possibilities. And we move then into quite an intangible space. This is where we get into human experience and the outcomes that people need and we move away from widgets and outputs okay and remember nick talked to us about creating outcomes for people meaningful outcomes this is the kind of place where we try and understand what they are so we might have done some work and we arrive at this insight which is actually customers are concerned about risk and value so they're not buying our stuff our widgets are not selling as fast because there's this level of concern. Now that gives us a lot of room to move in a solution. Can you see that? Customers are concerned about risk and value. We've moved away from prices. We've moved away from something which is about the company and we're now understanding what the customers are needing from us. So then we can move into a solution space with this new knowledge. So let's have a look at that. So these are just some ideas you might come up with. We could do demonstrations to support them to understand the value of the widgets that we're selling. We could do better marketing so that we better explained how our widgets would work in their life and how little risk there was to them. We could do trials. We could allow them to do trials. Um, and the way our salespeople and our company talked about itself and our widgets, we could build that trust and reduce their sense of risk. Okay, so we've got a lot more ideas there. We've gone quite wide in our thinking. Okay, so then let's move to the next slide, Alexandra. We might then prototype something or pilot it or test it out. And one of the things we might do in this circumstance is let's have a try before you buy um, product and a service made available. Now, this is, as I said, this is speed dating through a method. But what I hope you can see is that by moving through a fairly disciplined, rigorous approach to move from a solution to a problem um, to a problem space allows you to broaden your opportunity it's not just accepting that when someone comes to you with a solution it's actually meeting the need so it's taking a design lens which is about testing it's about learning it's about not settling too quickly on a single solution and as melissa pointed out earlier there's a whole lot of ands in here. I don't, I don't want you to walk away thinking that design is a linear process that just ends because essentially this just goes on and on and on. And we, we might um, test something and then iterate it and pivot it a little bit. And then we'll test it again and we learn more things. And we might become more and more granular or more and more specific or more and more effective each cycle that we do. But doing this kind of thinking gives you that space to breathe. It allows that participation that we were talking about in those multiple perspectives because we can bring them in when we're looking for insights and we're looking to get into that problem space. And then again, when we're looking to prototype and test, we can seek to do that with multiple people and multiple perspectives. 
So that's a bit of a method. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone can, has ever done anything like this before. Getting to the end of the day, aren't we? Everybody's a bit weary, <laughs> which is fine. Ah, I'm going to come back to this question and give you some thinking time about the method. So, Nolwen, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Your question is how to deal with other people, brackets, colleagues and partners, blocking habits especially with, when they are your superiors or direct colleagues? Yeah, that is a really, really great question. And there's a whole ecosystem, obviously, sits around design. And it's hard to, it's hard to take this approach, isn't it, when nobody else is doing it? It's like you're going off to outer space and everyone is staying on Earth. So it works best if you can have a shared conversation have shared language and have a, um, a shared intention that you want to work in this way. Um, you know, at Huddle, you know, many of us have been doing this kind of work for many years. And because we have shared language, we can often call one another out. You know, we can say, oh, you're not listening from the right place there, or that's not very open minded. And it's not seen as a chastisement or um, um, a calling out, it's rather seen as a gentle reminder of the best way for us to do the work. And so I guess my advice to you, Nolwen, would be if, that, if you wanted to explore bringing these mindsets to your work, that you have a conversation with your colleagues um, and your superiors and you, you talk about how you'd like to be and that you'd like their help in doing that and see if you can um, if you can support one another gently to do this. Yeah. Diane, she hasn't used this method. Where can we get more information? Oh gosh, there's so many places to get more information. Um, as I said, DRC are going to they can share these slides with you. So please just ask them for those and feel free to reach out to me and we can support you in finding some more information and um, find out what you're trying to do. I wonder, Jo, this is probably, I know we don't have very long to go. I feel like this has been a, quite a sprint and, and a bit of an unsatisfactory experience because it's not particularly interactive. But I think now, Joe, it would be a great time to do that circling back and to, to, to think about how anything that I've talked about today might support people in their accountability work, um, in the digital context. I don't know if you want to speak to that or people just want to um, just explore that a little and, and do some wondering. Alexander, could you maybe go to the next slide then, please? Um, but I, I think I have more more questions than I do answer, Cindy. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe if I can, maybe just another question to you. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, usually a lot of effort that we put into designing programs and project proposals, et cetera. So I'm just trying to think at what stage, wh when would you in encourage us as humanitarian practitioners to, to, to do this? Is it, is it? I don't know, is it at what stage? Is it really in that design process as well, obviously, or before, like pre-design or that whole project yeah. cycle management um, part? And then how do we how do we uh, include people of concern in it as well? Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, the beauty with this kind of approach is that you can apply it at every single um, stage of the work you're doing. You can use a human-centred approach. You can use these mindsets. You can use this expansive and then convergent thinking when you're looking at setting up a strategy or a policy. You can look at it in actually designing the program and then look at the people of concern being participating in that. When you're looking to evaluate things, you can actually co-design and take a human-centered approach to what are meaningful measures. You know, a lot of what we've heard today has been about the sheer amount of data collected and the sheer number of surveys 
that people are asked to um, complete, they can be co-designed and you can have part, um, multiple perspectives involved in doing that so that what is collected is meaningful to not just the people collecting but the people sharing the information. I don't know if that's too broad for you and you're looking for something more specific, Joanna, but that's what I would suggest. I mean, and the, the other thing, I guess, is that you you know your own organisation and you know your own cadences and you know your own ways of working. And it's it works best when it's it's embedded in your way of working and it, it can become part of your your rhythms rather than some kind of strange bolt on, if that makes any sense. <laughs> it makes some sense. <laughs> And are there, are there any kind of specific resources that you can recommend or like, and also kind of key questions as we go through that, that process and that cycle of? Um, we do have, um, and we have written a couple of guides and there are quite a few guides out there in the ether about how to do this and they, they set it out in quite a sequential way and some of them are question based i've written a question based one um but again it, it does need to be more hmm, i was going to say oh melissa's written something a, a, an approach that is native to your context and organization mm -hmm. yeah but i can certainly we can certainly look at finding some resources for you to support you yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. I also think kind of that's it's a major challenge for us. I mean, we know that there's very well documented kind of reasons why, for example, participation is not taking place as much as it should. You know, it should really be a routine custom in the day to day work that we all do, um, regardless of the spectrum of participation and the locally kind of appropriate methodologies, etc. cetera. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's about how do we make sure that we actually do this and that it's a non negotiable and that it really becomes kind of a marker for, for you know, an indicator of success for our programs to make sure that, that, that we're taking the time to listen and then we're mm -hmm. taking the time to, to um, be responsive as well. Mm. I mean, what I would say to that is that it's not, a, um, it's not a solo activity. It's really a team sport and that the best way to be supported is to set up those communities of practice and um, networks within your own organisation and across the sector so that you can be building that capability and supporting one another. Because whilst, you know, we make it sound easy, just adopt some mindsets and, you know, do some work, actually it requires rigour and practice and it's not always easy. It's It can be challenging and hard and you need to support one another and to build that capability. Um, so I really suggest that. I mean, the other thing, if any people are really want to go down this um, this path, I would suggest that you look at the book that Melissa Sanova wrote. Um, we can put the links up. Um, it's called This Human, and it's about being the person who who is the designer, and and it's about all the resources and the personal resources and reflection that you need to do. Um, oh, here we go. The links in the chat. Um, there's also this human um, community page and we have resources on our Huddle website, which is in the final slide um, and which Joanna um, and Alexandra can share with you. But, um, yeah, as I said, this is really just a, a very top-level speed date on how might you begin to think about bringing a more human-centred approach to your work within the humanitarian context and in particular, thinking about the digital world. Perfect. I think we're actually out of time, but there are a couple more questions in the chat, and I think your colleague um, Melissa is on that, so that's fantastic. Um, Great. Yeah, well, Great. thank you so much, Cindy, and also for doing this so late. Um, but, yeah, no, really important exercise and always important to reflect on the mindsets that we bring and also kind of the possibilities that can emerge when we actually take time to listen and understand people. So thank you so mm -hmm. much. Um, yeah. And our pleasure. Yeah, really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you. It's great. Yeah. And to anyone who's here, please feel free to reach out. 
to myself or Melissa um, through our website, wearehuddle.com, which we'll put in the chat. Um, and yeah, I really hope that you take some of this forward and thank you so much for um, allowing us to be part of this event. Thanks so much. Cheers.